This talk is about overcoming bias in DNA mixture interpretation. Forensic DNA identification is presumed to be neutral. Many think it stands for does not advocate for one side or the other. As such, DNA is the gold standard of forensic science. But the National Academy of Sciences report, the NAS report in 2009, which pointed out many problems with forensic analysis, including bite marks, hair analysis, bullet analysis, fingerprints, did note that there may be problems with how the DNA was interpreted, such as when there are mixed DNA samples. Professor Bill Thompson has written about the Texas sharpshooter fallacy in forensic DNA interpretation. Uh, that's where the target is painted around wherever the bullet actually is, rather than trying to get the bullet in a neutral target in the first place. And he's described how the bias of knowing what the answer is supposed to be, the DNA profile, can shift the DNA match target to a desired biased result. His paper describes a low-level DNA profile that could admit several interpretations. And when DNA analysts were shown profiles after the fact, they could account for how virtually every Tom, Dick, and Harry might be included in this profile. And so by looking at the profile of a defendant during interpretation of DNA evidence, this led to bias and post hoc justifications that might incorrectly include innocent individuals. EDL Drawer and Greg Hampikian have also written about subjectivity and bias in forensic DNA mixture interpretation. They reported some empirical data that suggested that DNA mixture interpretation is subjective. When the original two DNA analysts examined mixture data with case context, as shown in red, they both included a defendant. However, subsequently in this study, when 17 similarly trained DNA analysts were shown the identical DNA mixture data, this time without the context or knowing the answer, only one of the 17 included the individual. 12, the vast majority, excluded the defendant, and four found the DNA mixture to be inconclusive. And this uh, suggested that case context could have a major impact on the conclusions in DNA mixture interpretation. A DNA mixture arises when two or more people contribute their DNA to the same sample. Uh, in this ex example, we show how genotypes are combined. A genotype is the pair of alleles that an individual has at a genetic location. Uh, there are two alleles, one inherited from the person's mother and one uh, inherited from their father. So here we see how a first genotype, which has a short tandem repeat, or STR allele, of length 10 and length 12, is combined with a second genotype at that locus, having allele 11 and allele 12. And these two genotypes, 1012 plus 1112, can be combined in the same sample to produce data that has peaks, as shown on the right, uh, that have alleles 10, 11, and 12, more than two alleles suggesting that there's at least two people present. The heights of the peak suggest the quantities of DNA. Uh, this is an oversimplified diagram that leaves out many of the known artifacts and vagaries of the data. Interpreting DNA evidence proceeds in two steps. The first is to separate the mixture data into the genotypes of each of the contributors. Shown here are some data on the left, and now it's separated into two genotypes at this locus. The first genotype lists six allele pairs, each with some probability. The reason is, is that from the population there may be as many as a hundred possible allele pairs, but the data constrains what the genotype can be, limits the possibilities, thereby producing identification information, and it's usually not expected to have only one genotype value on the list, uh, but rather a list of more than one possibility with associated probabilities. 
In this example, the probabilities associated with each of the two contributors are different, uh, with more probability uh, weighted on 1012 in the first genotype and more on 1112 in the second genotype. And this separation unmixes the DNA mixture. The second step of DNA mixture interpretation is to compare a separated genotype at a genetic locus with a known reference standard. Here we see how 1112 is the standard, and that selects out from the list the 1112 with 40% probability shown for the second genotype. A match statistic is the ratio of the probability of this specific match with the evidence divided by the probability of coincidence. Here we see on the bottom that it's 40% in the numerator, that the evidence has a genotype with an 1112 uh, value, and the denominator uh, has a, say, 4% chance of seeing the 1112 in the population by coincidence. This ratio of 40% divided by 4% is 10, which is the match statistic at this locus. Notice that if all the probability had been 100%, we would have had a higher match statistic of 100 over 4, or 25. Cognitive bias occurs when illogical thinking affects decisions. There are many sources of cognitive bias, and here we'll focus on just two. In confirmation bias, the interpretation of evidence confirms one's initial belief. Oversimplification is a bias where simplicity trumps accuracy, and so data or interpretation may be modified for the purpose of simplicity. Uh, instead of getting the correct answer. With contextual bias, background information affects decisions. There are again many types of contextual bias, and here are two of uh, particular importance in forensic science. There's a motivational bias to reach a desired outcome. Uh, this may be because of one's employer, or the importance of a case, or the role of an analyst uh, in a case, uh, getting the bad guy, or excluding the good guy. There's also a social desirability bias, which is to want to be seen positively. For example, to want to help in convicting someone who may be considered guilty, or uh, in not being ripped apart on cross-exam because of a lack of understanding of DNA evidence. Let's look at five different sources of bias in DNA mixture interpretation. First is data bias, where analysts discard evidence based on other uh, cognitive or contextual information they may have. Uh, for example, shown on left is a mixture with uh, peaks that are lower at 10, increasing up to 12. An analyst may subjectively decide that the 10 peak is very small and it represents stutter, which is a copying artifact in the data. And as shown here by turning the peak white, just discards the data altogether and says it's not there. Alternatively, uh, they may apply a threshold. This is very common with the older methods of the last 15 years. A red line, shown here, is drawn through the data, and any peaks that are underneath that data are just thrown out and not used in DNA mixture interpretation, even though you can obviously see them. So here, the 10 and the 12 peak are just gone. They're not used, and only the peak over 12 is present, and often analysts won't even use the peak height. They'll just say it's in there. Lastly, a locus may not support a conclusion, or it may be too ambiguous for an analyst to use, and so all the data is thrown out. The locus is completely gone, often having seen the DNA profile of a defendant. The decision's made, let's not use this data. A genotype bias occurs when the actual genotype, the probability distribution, is transformed into something else that's more desirable, maybe because it's simpler or maybe because it helps reach a particular conclusion. Here we see how different genotype possibilities with one main possibility at 1012 with 75% probability is just converted into a 1012 because the analyst chooses one genotype to simplify the problem. Uh, this is done in the random match probability, or RMP, mixture interpretation method. And it, the result is to inflate the DNA match statistic by putting 100% weight in the numerator instead of only the 75% that 
that scientifically belongs there. There is also a match bias in DNA mixture interpretation that occurs at the level of calculating a statistic. With the combined probability of inclusion, or CPI, an analyst begins by first including the suspect, having already modified the data. A CPI has an unrealistic, unproven model, and as shown in the paper above, uh, published in the Journal of Pathology Informatics, CPI is a random number generator that lacks probative value. Even with likelihood ratios, or LRs, an analyst can ignore much of the data. Uh, the calculation in the end does require a suspect genotype. Many of these LR methods introduce phantom peaks that have evidence not even present in the data using dropout models, and they typically con consider very few of the genotype possibilities out of everything that uh, could be a genotype. There's a process bias in much mixture interpretation done by people. Uh, the first step shown on the left is that an analyst can subjectively choose, alter, discard, edit, or manipulate the DNA signals. That's routine in current interpretation. Secondly, having manipulated the data, they then compare a defendant's genotype to this edited data and decide if the defendant's in the DNA evidence. As shown on the right in blue, only if the person is included in the manipulated data will they even calculate a DNA mixture statistic. What's wrong with this is that the hidden cognitive and contextual biases largely determine the DNA match statistic outcome, and these are hidden from the judge, the jury, or any description of the process in the report. Instead, they're presented as unbiased DNA identification science. There is also a software bias in why labs choose their DNA mixture interpretation software. Uh, here are some reasons we hear of. Uh, the software can put an analyst in charge or get results that confirm their expert beliefs. But this is just confirmation bias and shouldn't be in the software at all. The software can simplify the DNA problem by removing many possibilities and use less of the data. That's an oversimplification bias. The software can help them get a desired answer by letting them manipulate thresholds, parameters, dropout values, and so on. Well, that introduces motivational bias in this ostensibly objective software. Here are other reasons. The FBI uses it, or it fits right into my familiar current process. Now, that's a social desirability bias that has nothing to do with objective, accurate science. How can lawyers keep biased DNA evidence out of the courtroom? Uh, one is to make it inadmissible uh, by filing and getting uh, approval for a motion to suppress based on relevance, or the Federal Rules of Evidence 403. The idea of this, as shown on the left, is that evidence makes a fact more or less probable, uh, but the probative value of DNA is often greatly inflated in DNA match statistics. On the right side, we see that Rule 403 says that evidence can be excluded if it's substantially outweighed by a danger of unfair prejudice or other factors like confusing the issues or misleading the jury. And that's what we have with DNA. Uh, just saying the word DNA, uh, do not acquit, means the introduction of, of, of unfair prejudice if, in fact, the DNA really doesn't have the probative value that the uh, proffer of the evidence claims that it does. In the cross-examination of an expert DNA witness, hundreds of effective questions can be asked that will elicit bias. For example, uh, one can ask, did you know the defendant's genotype during your analysis of the evidence? Uh, this is usually true, and you can explore uh, different variations of that to determine how it might have been used during mixture interpretation. Also, following up, doesn't knowing your customer's desired answer, your motivational bias, uh, affect your decisions? Uh, they could say yes or no, but the point is being made. Finally, uh, along this thread, have any scientific studies demonstrated otherwise? Well, uh, no, of course not. But either they don't know about them or you do know about some, and you're bringing out the possibility of bias by having looked at the answer in front of the jury. Sequential unmasking has been proposed as a way of reducing bias in human DNA review of mixtures. 
The idea is to first have a human analyze the crime scene data without knowing the case context or DNA profile references, and only then afterwards make comparisons of what's been elicited from the data relative to these reference samples. But there is still potential human bias in how people choose the data, how they conduct the mixture analysis, and how they make the comparisons. Human analysts can always introduce bias. So why is a human even involved in the process? Why not use an unbiased computer instead? An unbiased interpretation can be done by using an objective computer to first examine all the DNA data without having a suspect's genotype, secondly, separate genotypes of each DNA mixture contributor, considering all possible allele pair solutions for each of the contributors, and thirdly, compare genotypes only afterwards, only after the genotypes have been separated to calculate match statistics. Using an objective computer in this way eliminates all human involvement to overcome cognitive and contextual bias in DNA mixture interpretation. An objective computer removes data bias by using all the evidence. There are no peak choices. A computer with a Bayesian model learns stutter from the evidence. There are no thresholds that can be played with. Instead, a computer can have a rich Bayesian model that models variation directly from the DNA mixture evidence. And there are no locus choices if you're using all the loci all the time. With an objective computer, there's no genotype bias. Whatever the separated genotype for a contributor looks like as a probability distribution at a locus is what's actually used. And what's desired is to use the actual genotype probability and not having a person change the probability to make things simpler or lead to a desired conclusion. Match bias can be eliminated by using accurate calculations for the statistics. The CPI method uh, should never be used. It's just a random number generator, bad forensic science. And in fact, uh, it's been used in hundreds of thousands of cases, and honestly, all of them need to be reviewed again to look for potentially exculpatory evidence uh, where this method uh, failed. With likelihood ratios, there are many different versions and software programs, but whatever the the calculation is should not ignore any of the data. It can't use suspect genotypes. It shouldn't use methods that concoct phantom peaks that aren't even present in the data, and it must use all genotype possibilities, not just the obvious few. To eliminate process bias, remove the analyst from the process. Then first, A human can't change the data signals based on things they've heard. Secondly, the human analyst can't use a defendant genotype that they may have seen because if they're not in the process, steps one and two are gone, and we've eliminated cognitive and contextual bias from the process. Now we're only left with three, shown in blue on the right, calculating an accurate DNA mixture statistic and not saying anything that is biased, and just presenting unbiased science in reports and in testimony. To eliminate software bias, only calculators that produce true DNA match statistics should be used. These results must be accurate, giving the correct answer. Objective, not letting extraneous information in. Thorough, using all the data, considering all possibilities, deriving it from the data, not from preconceptions or calibrations, and validated, fit for purpose on the data to which it's being applied. Uh, The extraneous factors for choosing software, like making the analyst feel good about themselves or because the FBI likes it, are not factors. Rather, a process should be used with accurate software that examines all the data without human choice, separates genotypes, considers all solutions, and compares genotypes, letting the match statistic decide the outcome, not human prejudices, bias, or preconceived notions. Cybergenetics True Allele Mixture Interpretation Technology was designed to meet all of these unbiased criteria. You can learn more about it by visiting Cybergenetics' website, where there are courses, newsletters, articles, and talks, or by 
visiting our YouTube channel. Thank you very much.